I'm publishing this video on Veterans Day 2021, and the purpose is twofold. First is to show you three nice uh, bring back weapons uh, my dad brought back from World War II from Germany, and also to tell a little bit about the experiences uh, that he had in the war and that of the 102nd Infantry Division, which uh, fought its way across uh, northern Germany uh, until the surrender. Uh, the first gun is a Femaru 37M, uh, made in 1939. It's in 380. Uh, the second pistol is a Walther P38, uh, made by the Walther factory in 1944. And the third one is going to be a P08 Luger, made by DWM in 1918. I think the collection is noteworthy in that uh, everything that he brought back at the end of the war is still here in the same um, condition, and all the components uh, are there as he brought them back. So we have, uh, you know, some history on the weapons, unlike um, many of the videos that I see about, uh, you know, nice relics, but there's really no idea where they came from. They've been passed through the hands of uh, multiple collectors. Um, a little bit about my dad. He went to the University of Florida and was in ROTC in Pershing Rifles. And he um, later went on to OCS in 1943 and graduated and then was commissioned at the end of December 1943 uh, as a second lieutenant of infantry. He was assigned to the 102nd as a platoon leader, an infantry platoon leader. and. Uh, was to join the 102nd in Camp Swift, Texas, where they had uh, gone into training. Um, one of the interesting things I found amongst the memorabilia that my dad had were uh, this collection of his Ozark patch, his infantry rifles, and second lieutenant bars. I uh, think it's a, there's a good chance that these are the ones, uh, maybe even in that picture, you can see that the threads uh, around the Ozark patch are brown, which would uh, correspond to the, the brown wool Class A uniforms uh, that they wore then. And the second lieutenant bars, uh, he didn't keep them long, as he would have been um, promoted to first lieutenant a little over a year from then. So I think the collection is something that he put together to commemorate his uh, commissioning as a second lieutenant. And they were all in the, a small box along with some other memorabilia from that same time frame. As I said earlier, after he was commissioned, he joined the 102nd who was uh, in uh, Camp Swift, Texas, and also uh, in the Louisiana, Mississippi maneuver areas preparing to um, uh, sail over to Europe and uh, join the war effort. Uh, you can see here's a picture of him. Uh, my dad's platoon uh, during a stint of R&R, &R, I think. I see some Spanish moss hanging down from the top. So uh, anyway, that's him seated at the front with, uh, with his platoon, uh, yucking it up, I guess, before they uh, transfer out. Uh, and they did. They took trains uh, up to Fort Dix, New Jersey. They then um, went to New York City, boarded six transport ships, and headed to Cherbourg on the northern tip of the Normandy Peninsula. Uh, it was a very important po uh, port. Most of the men and material for the Western Front at that time came in through Cherbourg. And here's the route that the 102nd took when they disembarked from Cherbourg 23 September, moved across northern France and through Belgium and to the panhandle of Holland where they uh, joined up with the Front. Uh, on the way to the Front, I think this is a picture that was snapped of my father um, and his platoon sergeant. Uh, Sergeant First Class Virgil Kennedy from Kansas. And uh, you can see that the weather is warm, and I would think that the picture was taken uh, late September, early October when the weather was warm because it uh, got quite a bit colder once they uh, got to the frontier of, of uh, Germany. And you can see they have M1 carbines. Uh, I'm sure that that's what the uh, TONE specified for them. Uh, but later on in the war, I have pictures of my dad with, uh, with a 45. So apparently he ditched uh, the carbine, and here he is with a shoulder holster and a 45. And later on, here's one uh, that he's wearing on his hip. Also in that previous picture, they have um, trench knives on their left side with a little, uh, looks like parachute cord uh, lanyard tied to it. 
Well, I, I have the uh, trench knife uh, here. It, the scabbard is missing. My dad used this knife uh, in the garden uh, as kind of a utility thing, uh, but uh, I use it as a letter opener. As I said, the 102nd joined the front at the end of October, and they took their first casualties uh, there when they were assigned uh, here on the German frontier in the southern tip of the Netherlands. And I think the casualties are probably due to artillery because it wasn't until the first part of November when the second, when the 102nd Division was involved in a multi-division push uh, through the Siegfried Line area. In front of the 102nd Division was the town of Geilenkirchen, which uh, had the Siegfried Line in front and behind it. Um, I have a plan of the defenses of the so-called secondary Siegfried Line, and it looks uh, pretty doggone formidable. you, you got to wonder what the primary Siegfried Line looked like. Uh, this particular section of it is in the secondary line is about uh, three and a half miles top to bottom and about four miles left to right. Viewing the legend up there in the upper right, you can see that there are numerous pillboxes and bunkers, artillery and anti-tank guns, infantry weapons, trenches and wire, ditches and mines, and community digging. I guess they had the populace out there uh, digging ditches as well. But if you thought that the German army was most uh, expert in the offense, I think that judging from the complexity and the, this uh, formidable uh, defensive plan, they were just as expert uh, when on the defense. Well, back to the subject of the firearms, the collection that my dad brought back. Uh, I want to talk about the Luger because it really has the only story that he told about how he got a hold of it. And the story is that uh, he and his platoon were moving through a German town um, and they uh, noticed a house that had a wall around the back garden and he went through a gate to investigate uh, what was back there and when he turned the corner of the house he came uh, face to face with a German soldier and he said that the Germans surrendered first uh, <laughs> so I suppose uh, perhaps with if he still had that M1 carbine, he would have outgunned the German who had a Luger in a holster. But nonetheless, it's a very, very nice rig. The Luger itself is a DWM from 1918. It's uh, all matching serial numbers. The bore is in great shape. It's, uh, it shoots very accurately. The sights stink. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, all the parts are numbered, including um, stamped on the inside of the, of the grips. Uh, are the last two numbers of the four-digit serial number 78 and you can see that here. The magazine is also World War I. You can tell that because it's the walnut base on the magazine and it is uh, got a serial number on it and a proof mark but it is not numbered to the gun unfortunately but it is the World War I time frame and which was probably uh, issued uh, in World War II with the pistol. Uh, looking at the holster, it is uh, in excellent condition. It's supple, there's no cracks in it. It has all of the uh, components with it, including a spare magazine that was uh, captured uh, with the holster. It's a World War II vintage, which makes sense. It's the one with the aluminum base, and you can see that the magazine itself is tin plated. The uh, Luger tool is present. The tool uh, is used for uh, helping to load the magazine. Uh, also on the tip is a screwdriver, and uh, that would be used for removing the screw uh, holding the grips on. Uh, putting that back, also you can see that on the reverse of the holster are a very clear set of uh, markings, including the Waffenamt and the manufacturer. Uh, here's a close-up of it. G.J. Insink and Company of Ordruf uh, made the holster, and it was delivered in 1939. While the Luger might have been the most desirable pistol, number two would be a Walther P38. Yeah, the Walther, even though it didn't quite have the status of the Luger, was still very desirable. Um, this particular one is made in the uh, Walther factory. You can see... Uh, here on the slide that it's um, AC44 and the serial number has got an E suffix. So the E suffix would have meant that this gun was produced in 
uh, June of 1944. Uh, Walther had a goal of each month producing 10,000 um, P-38s, and they pretty much did that throughout 1944. The 10,000 made the month of January would not have a suffix, and the month of February would have the suffix A, March would be B, etc., so that we know that the E suffix means that it was made in June. Yeah, this particular example is in excellent shape. You can see that it has uh, holster wear, which is to be expected. Uh, otherwise, though, it's in very good shape. There's a little bit of corrosion here where it, um, it has been handled. But um, the mechanics of it are in pristine condition. And uh, the, the bore, is, as you can see, is in pristine condition. It shoots really well. Uh, the sights are way better than the Luger. If you pull back the slide and try to take a look at the bolt face, you can see just how a uh, few times this gun was shot. Uh, you can see here that there's not that circle of uh, primer pocket blow-by which cuts and etches a little circle around where the primer uh, is situated on the cartridge. Uh, here's an example from a, an older P38 where you see that, that ring kind of etched into the bolt face. Also, looking again at the bolt face, you can see the machining marks uh, really clearly. So this, this gun has not been fired very much at all. Looking now at the Walther uh, holster, uh, you can see that it's a soft shell. It's in good shape, a little wear showing on it. Uh, it's got a spare magazine, which is uh, just like the magazine in the gun. They are uh, contemporary with the gun when it was issued. The magazines are stamped with uh, a P-38 V stamp, which they started making at the Walther factory in April of 1944. On the spine of the magazine, you have the Waffenamt, which is the Eagle 359. Um, and I would think that there's a good chance that this, uh, these two magazines, the holster and the pistol, were issued together uh, to the German soldier. On the reverse side of the holster, you have the manufacturer's code DKK, and uh, here's what it stands for. Uh, also, you have a very faint, unfortunately, uh, Waffenamt um, on the back, which uh, is, is tough to see. The holster is in uh, really good condition, I would say, except for obvious uh, wear and tear. Continuing on with the 102nd Infantry Division, after they had penetrated the um, Siegfried line, they advanced along an axis uh, pr pretty much to the north and east. Uh, of course, they hit the industrial areas of the Rhineland. They fought a large battle at the battle at uh, Krefeld, just uh, north of Dussel Dusseldorf and Cologne. And they continued their advance until late uh, April when they came to the Elbe River uh, due west of Berlin, about uh, 30 or 40, well, about 40 miles west of Berlin. And they were ordered to halt and wait for the Russians. If you remember your World War II history, the Russians were fighting the Battle of Berlin at that time. And by the first uh, couple of days in May, they had um, captured Berlin and were moving then to the west to meet up with the Allied forces along the Elbe. And in so doing, they were driving uh, huge masses of civilians and German soldiers ahead of them who were obviously anxious to um, surrender to the Americans and instead of the Russians. Uh, this is a picture of the bridge over the Elbe River in the 102nd uh, sector, and it's a railroad and highway bridge combined that had been bombed uh, down into the river. However, uh, foot traffic could pick their way across it. And you can see the floodplain uh, there towards uh, Berlin to the east of the, of the Elbe River. All the refugees were being shelled by the Russians at this time as they were um, trying to escape. The bridge is at a town called uh, Tangermunda, there on the Elbe, on the, on the west bank of the Elbe. And as the refugees and soldiers made their way across the bridge, they came into the waiting arms of the, of the Ozarks. And you can see here the huge masses of German soldiers. I think there was 118,000 German soldiers uh, surrendered to the uh, Ozarks at this time. Um, you can also see that their arms were taken from them and stacked in giant piles, <laughs> in this case on the railroad bed uh, on the uh, west bank of the river. Uh, 
You can also see here that a, a general is surrendering. He happened to have one of those amphibious uh, Volkswagens uh, to get across the river. Over the years, I've speculated on how my dad came across this Hungarian 37M uh, in 380. The Hungarians made a version of this in 32 ACP, and the Germans used them primarily uh, in the Luftwaffe for their uh, pilots. I don't know if you've ever seen the cockpit of a ME-109. It's about the size of a bathtub. So uh, it's a well-made, reliable pistol, well-suited for uh, small areas like uh, air crews or tankers might experience. The uh, pistol dis itself is a, a straight blowback design, uh, borrows a lot from uh, Browning designs. The German version has a thumb safety, um, and again, it's in 32 ACP. This one happens to be in 380, uh, made for either the army or the police, and I think with the um, crown of St. Stephen there, that it is made for police. And when I'm talking police, the Hungarians were fascists and their police were kind of like a, a vicious national guard. But Hungarian divisions did fight alongside the uh, German divisions, especially in the east against the Russians. And they would have been a part of this uh, mass of refugees uh, fleeing to the west and, and into uh, allied hands. So one of the possibilities for my dad uh, being able to acquire this thing uh, would have been to have been present there and uh, picked it up out of the uh, mass of weapons that were being uh, dropped off there. It's a plausible explanation uh, when you're there and mountains of weapons are piling up in front of you of every description. I can see where, you know, you might say, oh my gosh, look at here. Well, that just about wraps it up for this discussion of my father. Uh, in the 102nd Infantry Division on this uh, Veterans Day 2021. Uh, any comments or corrections would be appreciated, and I'll be following up this video with um, others uh, concerning um, the 102nd and also some of the weapons uh, that I have, uh, including these three. I'll just cover them in more detail.